you have a Bible, open it up to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians 10, <clears throat> and the title of the message is, uh, as, you, as you noticed on the sign out side, I'm sure, is no one can serve two masters. And the verses we'll be looking at um, from verse 14 to 22. No one can serve two masters. It's the subject Paul is dealing with here in this section. Uh, before we get into it, let's pray again. Lord, we come to you this morning. We th we're thankful, Lord, to be here, Lord. Um, and you know, Lord, I know we're a small group, but there's something special about small groups. And Lord, in fact, you know, you chose 12 and you poured yourself into those 12. And through those 12, you impacted the entire world, Lord. Um, and so, Lord... I pray that for each one who's here today, Lord, I'm asking that we would be disciples, Lord. A, a disciple is a, is a learner. I pray that we're here today to learn, Lord, to learn from you, uh, to, to receive your word unreservedly, Lord, to come with no prejudice, um, that you would clean out our hearts of any objections, Lord, to the things you have to say to us. And you help each one of us just to sit at your feet now and hear your word and receive from you, Lord. And so we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, <clears throat> last time, last week, in verse 1 to 13, um, Paul used the bad example of the Israelites uh, to warn the Corinthians not to follow in their steps. If you look at verse 6, Paul said, speaking of the Israelites of old, he said, now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And Paul went on to point out um, the four sins that disqualified all but, two, all but two of them. Remember, it was only Joshua and Caleb out of that entire generation that entered the promised land. And the sins that disqualified them were idolatry, sexual immorality, uh, testing God's patience, and complaining against the Lord. And God declared concerning that generation in Psalm 95 that they would not enter his rest. Um, and again, all but two of them died in the wilderness. And they really serve as a classic example of what can happen to those who abuse and misuse the grace and the goodness of God and think that, you know, there will never really be any repercussions uh, for their sinful behavior. And, you know, this was a big problem in the church of Corinth. As there in the church of Corinth, there were many also who were abusing God's grace and using their liberties in Jesus Christ in a self-centered and in a self-indulgent kind of a way. And they were coming dangerously close in the name of Christian liberty to going back into idolatry, um, the very sin that Christ had rescued them from. And they were risking, um, like the Israelites, disqualification and the discipline and the chastening of the Lord upon their lives. And so in light of this, Paul said, if you look at verse 14, he said, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. We'll stop there. So flee. To flee, in other words, is to get away from it as fast as you can. You know, all forms of idolatry. Paul said, get away from that. And you know, when you're fleeing something, you're doing so to get away from immediate danger. Um, you know, kind of like the Jews during World War II. If they wanted to survive, um, they had to get out of Germany. And they had to get out of Nazi-occupied territories or run the risk of being sent into concentration camps and, and to their deaths. And so flee, it's, it's a strong word. And again, it speaks of getting away from something as fast as you can. And you know, that really should be the attitude of every believer towards sin. 
and towards anything that might entangle us in it. We should flee away from those things, especially idolatry. Because idolatry really is the most serious and the most contaminating sin there is. In fact, John MacArthur, listen to what he said concerning idolatry. He said, it strikes at the very character of God. Those who worship an idol declare that the Lord is not the only true God and that other so-called gods are worthy to share his glory and honor. They testify that the Lord is deficient, that he is not all wise, all powerful, and all sufficient. And you know, that is the greatest affront and the greatest dishonor a person can do to God. Do you know that? As John MacArthur said, idolatry, idolatry strikes at the very character of God. As those who bow down to idols, you know, whether it's through ignorance or just plain unbelief, they're testifying that God is not who he claims to be. He's not almighty. He's not all-powerful. He's not all-knowing. He's not the all-sufficient one. And that he's not able to meet their every need, nor is he worthy of all of their praise. And again, there is no greater offense than that to God. You know, we think of all the, we have a tendency to think of all the, terrible outward sins of the flesh as the worst things there are and they are bad but you know at the root of all those sins is idolatry is a denial and a rejection of God it's the attitude of the heart that God is most offended by in fact Paul he declared to the he declared in the book of Romans concerning the Gentile Gentile world that because they did not like to retain God in their knowledge and worship man-made idols instead, that therefore he gave them over to the lust of their own hearts and to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting for human beings made in the image and the likeness of God to do. And you know, he spoke of how even their women changed, exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones, lesbianism. He spoke of how men in the same way abandoned natural relations with women. They were inflamed with lust for one another. And men, he said, committed shameful acts with other men. These are the results, though, of idolatry and the rejection of the true God. You know, you know as God says to those who will not own him or serve him, fine, then you will serve your lust. And that's the worst thing that can ever happen to a person when God hands them over to their lusts. And you know, <clears throat> our society today is a case in point and is an illustration of what happens to a people when they deny the true God and embrace idolatry. And you know, make no mistake about it, the normalization and toleration today of people towards sin Sexual perversion, drug use, and every other vice going is the direct result of the denial of God. It's the results of a godless lifestyle. And God, as a result, today is abandoning men and women to their sin and to their lust. And the frightening thing about that is that whenever God does that, it's because he intends to bring his judgment upon a people and upon a nation. And you know what? That is a scary reality that is staring the United States of America right in the face today. And you know, our nation needs the prayers of God's people like never before. Because the only thing that's going to save this nation is a revival. I'm absolutely convinced of that. You know, the only thing that's going to save this country is a great turning away from sin and towards Jesus Christ. That's it. You know, God has a controversy with the nations, the Bible tells us, you know. And you look in history, you look at Israel, and you look at what they, they did the same things, you know. And God continued to punish them. He sent them famine, he sent them, sent them flood, he sent them fire, he sent them locusts, he sent them plagues. He said, but for all of these things, you have not turned to me. 
And he came to the point when he said, therefore, prepare to meet your God. You know? Idolatry is the root cause. You know, the hearts of people growing hard towards the Lord. And so Paul here warned them, flee idolatry. Get away from that. You know? Now, idolatry, of course, can take on many forms. It's not isolated to just bowing down or honoring graven images. Uh, you know, an idol can be an object. You know? It can be an idea. It can be a philosophy. It can be a habit. It can be an occupation. It can be a sport. Or really anything that comes between you and God and takes first place in your heart and keeps you from making a full commitment of yourself to God. Whatever that is, that is an idol. You remember there was a, a rich young ruler who came to Jesus in the Gospels. Remember he asked Jesus, what must I do you know, to have eternal life? And Jesus told him, you know, keep the commandments. But Jesus only quoted to him the second table of the law that had to do with man's relationship with his fellow man. Jesus deliberately left out that first table that had to do with man's relationship and responsibility responsibility to God because Jesus was seeking to show him his sin and so after quoting that second table of the law to him the rich young ruler said I've kept all these from my youth but he said but what do I lack you see he recognized there was something wrong inside he was not right with God and so Jesus told him what his problem was Jesus said go sell everything you have distributed all to the poor, and then he invited him. He said, come, take up the cross and follow me. But we read in the Gospels that the rich young ruler was sad at that word. And he went away from the Lord sorrowful because you see for him, his money and his wealth and his position in life was his God. It was the thing that was controlling him and it was the thing that was keeping him from the true God. And you know, he wasn't willing to give it up. Whatever comes between you and God is an idol. And the Lord will not allow his people to live between two opinions. He's a jealous God. We were studying that on Wednesday night. He's a jealous, he said, I, the Lord, am a jealous God. He said, my glory I will not give to another he wants all of our hearts. And so Paul here urgently pleading with them. And notice verse 14, the language. He said, my beloved. This was a rebuke, but notice it was given in tenderness and kindness. He referred to them as my beloved, my dear ones. And you know, that's, that's how God refers to us, especially when he rebukes, you know, when he convicts. You know, God will never accuse you. Understand that if you're a child of God. The devil will accuse you. God doesn't accuse you. God seeks to bring, draw you. And he will convict and he will cut. But you see, when God cuts to the heart, it hurts, but it hurts good. <laughs> it hurts in a good way. Because it draws you away from the sin. You know, it's that healing that needs to take place. Like a surgeon, you know, he... You know, you, get a, you have an operation. You know, you're not having the operation to die, but to, for your life to be saved. To cut whatever that, is, that cancer or whatever that is out of your body that's keeping you from living. It's the same way spiritually with the Lord and his conviction. And so Paul said, my beloved, flee idolatry. Get away from that. And then verse 15 to 17, he said, I speak as to wise men. Judge for yourselves what I say. You know, Paul said, you're wise. You're wise enough to understand what I'm talking about. Every Christian has the wisdom of God in their hearts. You know, we know the truth inside. That's one of the promises of the new covenant, in fact. One of the new covenant promises is that not everyone's going to have to say to his brother, know the Lord, but the Lord said, also know me, from the least to the greatest. And so he said, I'm speaking to you as to wise men. Judge for yourselves what I say. And then he went on, verse 16 and 17, he said, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? 
For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. So Paul reminded them here of the unity and, fellow, uh, the unity and fellowship that Christians share in. And notice, it's in the Lord. And it's in his, we are members, Paul said, of his body. We are one with Christ. You know? In fact, the Bible um, likens the relationship between the church and Christ as, remember, we're the bride of Christ. And that marriage covenant has the two become one flesh. Paul said, we are one with the Lord. And in the act of communion, we're partaking in that fellowship together. You know, the communion elements um, that we partake of regularly in the church, they represent our share in Christ and our share in the new covenant of God's grace through him. As the cup represents his blood that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. And the bread represents his body um, and his becoming a man and suffering in our place so that we might partake of God's nature once again through him. And again, there's a beautiful oneness and unity that we all share in Christ together. We are one with the Lord, but also one with each other as we partake of him together. That's what Paul is saying here. Verse 18, he said, Observe Israel after the flesh. Are not those who eat of the, of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? And now the same principle was evident under the Old Covenant as well, as when the Israelites brought their sacrifices to the Lord, um, a portion of it was burnt on the altar to God, a portion was given to the priest, and then a portion was given to the worshiper. And so there was, again, this oneness and this one unity that all parties involved shared in the whole experience and worship of God. And Paul's next point is that if this is so and there is a unity among all those who participate in the worship of God and the observance, observance of communion, then it is also the case in the worship of idols and pagan rituals, as those who participate in those things are also involved in a fellowship, but not with the Lord or with something that is good. In fact, quite the opposite. Look at verse 19. Paul said, what am I saying then? That an idol is anything? Or what is offered to idols is anything? And that's a rhetorical question, and which the, to which the answer is no. Uh, Paul already established back in chapter 8 that an idol is nothing in the world and um, that there is no other God but one. And the things offered to idols are of no value or virtue either. But that being so does not mean that idolatry is just something that is innocent or benign. There's a power behind idolatry. Look at verse 20. Paul said, rather, that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. Huh. The power behind idolatry in every false religious system is none other than Satan and demons. And Satan, being the great deceiver, seeks to keep men and women enslaved to idolatry and false religions. And he often does so through superstition, through fear. And he has a powerful grip on many people today and unbeknownst to many of those caught up in idolatry is the reality that they are actually having fellowship with demons and not with God when participating in idolatrous, idolatrous acts and ceremonies. And so Paul was writing these things in order to warn those in the church in Corinth who had come out of idolatry when they, when they received Christ to be careful not to be entangled in idolatry once again, because look at verse 21, as he said, he said here, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. You can't have it both ways, in other words. As Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. Jesus said, you will either hate the one and love the other or will hold to the one and despise the other. But you cannot serve them both. And thus, you cannot have fellowship with God and with demons at the same time. And you know, that's just basic Christianity 101. <laughs> Paul said in the book of Acts chapter 26, 
when giving his testimony before King Agrippa that the purpose of the gospel is to turn men and women from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, not leave them in the middle. But apparently some in Corinth had forgotten that and were attempting, as many do today, to live in between two worlds, to have one foot in God's kingdom and the other foot in the world. And they were dabbling a little here, and they were dabbling a little there again in idolatry, being unfaithful to the Lord. And you know, many people today, even in the church and people from Christian backgrounds, are dabbling in places they have no business being. You know, there are Christians who are getting caught up even in the occult. They don't even realize it. And some of the movies that are being put out today, they're straight from the occult. You know, there's a new Marvel movie that just came out. Um, <clears throat> I forget what it's called. What's it called? Doctor Strange. And these seem like, you know, just little innocent, cute little movies. They used to kind of be, but they're, they're taking a dark turn. They're getting into the occult and into witchcraft and into demonic possession and things like that. My daughter went to see, to see it, uh, and she didn't realize it. Um, with some of her friends, and she, and she said they walked out of the theater because they couldn't believe what they were watching as people, they were glorifying demon possession and, and spells and things like that. You know. you know, Christians, there are Christians today who get caught up in astrology, Scientology. There was a person who used to come to this church who one day started telling me how they were taking a class on Eastern meditation. Breathing techniques from Eastern meditation in order to cope with stress in their life. And they told me like it was no big deal at all. And I stood back and I didn't even know what to say. I thought to myself, what? You're a Christian. You say you're a Christian. Christians don't look to other gods, to other religions in order to cope with their problems in life. You know? But this person was while at the same time professing to be a worshiper of the true God. But let me tell you something. That is inconsistent. That is idolatry. As Paul said here so clearly in verse 21, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. We got to know that. You know, there are many people today, though, who don't seem to know that who are getting caught up, again, in all kinds of things. They have no place being as a child of God. And you know, you can't do both those things at the same time because God will not allow that. He won't allow that. You know? And if you're okay with doing those things, then I've got to question your salvation. Because the Holy Spirit... He, he possesses the heart, and God doesn't share house with demons. If you're okay with demonic things, then we've got to ask the question if you're truly born again, if, you've, if Christ is really Lord of your life, and if he's inside your heart. Now, can a Christian fall into those things? Apparently, yes, some in Corinth were. But the evidence of them being a true Christian is repentance. They won't stay in those things. It's, it's the pig that continues to mire in the mud, Peter talked about. It's a dog that returns to his own vomit, but it's not the child of God. The child of God will learn from those things, and the discipline of God will bring the child of God to repentance. God will discipline those who do those things, because, again, you can't partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Verse 22, Paul said, Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? So those intent on continuing in their idolatrous ways, Paul said, Are you provoking the Lord to jealousy? You know, that's a dangerous thing to do. Look at the Israelites of old. They put God to the test over and over again. But what happened? They were disinherited. 
They wandered through the desert. They never entered the promised land. You know, many Christians today wander through a wilderness simply because they will not obey the Lord. The first of the Ten Commandments is this. You shall have no other gods before me. No other gods before me. You know, that's priority number one. (laughs) And God, again, has declared in his word, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. You know, the Lord speaking through Isaiah the prophet said, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. Again, God doesn't share house. You know, Think of it like a marriage covenant. Would you be okay with your spouse going out with other people? No. Right? No. Be why? Because you married them. They belong to you and you belong to them. If you're a Christian, you've entered into a covenant with God through Jesus Christ. It's the new covenant in Christ's blood for the forgiveness of your sins. And God wants all of you, not just part. God will share his glory with no one. Understand that. And the reason why is because he alone is God. He is worthy of all of our praise. You remember when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment in the law? His response was, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. Notice that word, all. God wants all of us. All that you are. Now, again, now when the Bible says that God is a jealous God, let me clarify. It does not mean that his jealousy is like ours. And I was talking about this on Wednesday night. God doesn't get jealous and just inflamed with passion like we do. And you can praise him for that, you know. He's a holy God. He's perfect in all of his ways. And just like his anger is righteous, so is his jealousy. He is jealous for the honor and the renown of his name. Because again, he alone is God. He's the source of all life. He's the source of all truth. He's the source of all righteousness. He's the source of all goodness. And we owe our entire existence to him. And to deny him and to set up something else as God is to promote a lie of which Satan is the author and the power behind. And nothing provokes the Lord's jealousy and anger more than that. Which is why Paul called upon the Corinthians here to flee away from idolatry. You know? And he closed the section on this teaching as we just read, with a warning. As he said at the end of verse 22, asking that rhetorical question uh, to those in Corinth who were dabbling in idolatry and involved in places and things they ought not be, he said, are we stronger than he? Are we stronger than the Lord? Do you think you can contend with the Lord? (laughs) Do you think you can challenge God and win and acknowledge God and idols at the same time? You know, that there won't be any repercussions for that. You know? So the exhortation today is this, flee away from idolatry. Flee away. In all of its forms. And make a wholehearted commitment of yourself today to God. Because he alone is God, and he alone is worthy of all of our praise. And remember this, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. Joshua proclaimed to the people, the Israelites of old, he said, Choose ye this day whom you will serve. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for your word. A lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. And God, I pray that today we would make a wholehearted commitment of ourselves to you, Lord. Lord, we don't want to think that we can live between two opinions, Lord. You know, as Elijah said to the people of old, why do you live between two opinions? Choose, choose ye this day. If the Lord is God, then serve him. If the Baals are God, then serve them. 
Don't live between two opinions. Lord Jesus, as you said, no one can serve two masters. And so I pray today that we would commit ourselves wholeheartedly to you. It's in your name we pray, Lord.